Thank you very much, Nick, for kindly letting me present in front of this nice community. I'm Nick. I'm a PhD student in the Junior Professorship for Computational Life Science at MIT Aachen. And as Nick very well said, I am interested in photosynthesis of cyanobacteria and modeling it, and therefore kind of continuing the legacy of my professor. And that is exactly what I want to talk to you today. I will talk about our attempt at shedding light on cyanobacterial photosynthesis and more precisely about our recently published mathematical model of photosynthesis in Seneca Sisters PCC 6803. To start off, I would like to tell you the story of how we came to create. And this project is rooted at the roots of rice. Originally, we were interested in the growth of rice in paddies like these flooded. And under these conditions, the whole lower plant body is merged. And there have been multiple studies finding that there is sand bacteria living on side of these roots, colonizing them. And there are also instances where such fields here are deliberately inoculated with cyanobacterial strains. That is because the colonized plants show significantly increased growth, particularly in the roots. And such cyanobacteria could therefore be great natural fertilizers, as probably a lot of us are even researching. We were interested in this symbiosis as it involves two phototropic organisms as compared to the usual photograph heterotroph dynamic. So the first question we ask ourselves is if the sand bacteria are indeed actively photosynthesized, because being underwater drastically changes the light, of course, that they receive as compared to the plant. Not only will they receive less light due to the water's absorption and reflection, these phenomena of the water are also wavelength dependent. You can see that the absorption is much stronger in the red spectral range, splittering the other way around. So the solar spectrum that you see at the top will not be what the cyanobacterium shall sees. Now our question became how the cyanobacteria would behave under such different light quality conditions. And being computational life scientists, we wanted to use a mathematical model to look what the cyanobacteria would do under these light conditions. But sadly, no appropriate model was available for what exactly we were interested in. And so we decided to create our own model of cyanobacterial photosynthesis, the electron transfer chain model. This is an overview of processes in the model. All of the orange errors are reactions involving electrons, blue are protons, and these are the main reactions that we implemented according to literature. Each compound here, for example, plus the quinone, and each reaction, they are all described in mathematical terms. And that means for our reaction, we have certain kinetic rate equations that tell us how fast is a certain reaction going at a particular time point, depending on the compound concentration. And if a certain very important reaction is missing here, then tell us, because we would really like to know. Otherwise, I would just quickly go over the main characteristics that we identify as the main ones. Of course, the two photosystems, which absorb the light and drive photosynthesis. And we estimate the excitation rates for these photosystems from these simulated light absorption. And for that, we also include a description of the fibrobilisomes, the light harvesting antennae, but also of light adaption mechanisms like the orange carotenoid protein and state transitions. This will be important later. We also include thymocoidal respiration because, as you probably know, for cyanobacteria, it's quite special that the respiration is intercepting with the photosynthetic electron transport. It shares a membrane, and so electrons inserted from glycolysis directly integrate into photosynthetic electron flow. And that, of course, affects all of the other electron pieces. To complete the picture, we also include terminal oxidases, which reduce oxygen back to water. Not all terminal oxidases are just active in respiration. Some also in normal photosynthetic electron flux. We also include the carbon concentrating mechanism, which increases the CO2 concentration for higher efficiency CO2 fixation. And in our model, that is the concentration is increased by constant factor, but it does consider the cytoplasm pH to calculate how much C2 is actually usable for fixation. We lastly include carbon fixation and photorespiration, which of course are very large downstream pathways, downstream of photosynthesis. And since they're so large, we lump them into single reactions, which try to estimate the effect of both pathways on photosynthesis and estimate the rate without adding tons of reactions to the model. And these two fuzzy reactions have substrate dependency and are regulated by the redox. Overall, the model is dynamic over time, so we can simulate how these concentrations evolve because it's ordinary differential equation based. We use the principle of parsimonies. So we try to keep everything simple by using simple kinetics. 
mass action or Michaelis management. We like the large pathways, which I talked about, and overall the model stayed reasonably sized with six in differential equations and 23 reactions included. And overall, we needed 80 parameters and 62 of them are actually from literature directly taken. We also estimate the chlorophyll-like fluorescence to simulate fluorescence experiments. And you will see in just a moment, an example of that. As I told you in the beginning, which is quite important to me, we approximate the irradiance absorption. For that, we use a wavelength dependent function that takes into account the different pigments of standard bacteria. And that means we can use any light quality, quantity, and pigment content in our simulations, which if you think about the beginning, it's exactly what we wanted to answer the question. That is important because the photosystems in cyanobacteria bacteria have significantly different light preferences. Photosystem 2 absorbs more in the red together with the phycobilisomes, while photosystem 1 has more chlorophyll and absorbs in the blue and red spectrum. As the two photosystems mark entrance and exit points, if the spectrum changes, that also drastically alters the way that the electrons take through here. In general, we differentiate four different pathways the electrons can take. That is the linear pathway from water splitting to NADPH the water-water cycle from water and then back to reducing oxygen to water, electrons that are included by glycolysis through the respiratory pathway, and then cyclic electrons, which are excited at PS1, get inserted back into the chain and so cycle around. And these pathways create different amounts of ATP and DPH, which in turn affect the downstream metabolism, especially the carbon fixation on the carbons. This is why this is the first thing we looked at, the CO2 fixation and also the electron fluxes with it. At the top right, you can see different light spectra you would commonly find in biotechnological applications. Of course, solar light, but also different artificial lights, like fluorescent lamps, different LEDs. And here on the left, you can see one of our simulation results where we have these different light sources at different light intensities here on the X, and then simulated the CO2 consumption as a meter of photosynthetic activity. And you can see directly that there is major differences between these different light spectra at the same light intensity. The white light that we simulate in each of these cases is not simply white light. It's quite different. And if you want to look more into why that is, we can also look into the cellular process, into the reactions that take place and paths that the electrons take. And here, for example, you can see that in the very beginning, electrons mostly go the linear path to NADPH and also a bit with the cyclic. But in a certain point at higher light intensity, the linear electron flow stagnates and cyclic is replaced by the water-water cycle, which is known from literature that the water-water cycle is kind of an overflow valve electron highlights. We can also predict these pathways for simulated mutants. And here you see a highlight adaptive flavity iron protein, which is a major player in this water-water cycle. And the water-water cycle is strongly reduced. And overall, you see that at high lights, the whole electron flow gets impaired which again makes sense for a highlight adaptive protein. Such electron processes are hard to measure experimentally to cross-check our simulations. However, there is a method of exploiting the fluorescence of chlorophyll, and that is the photosynthesis measurement via pulse amplitude modulation. Just a short explanation of what we measure here, actually. If you excite chlorophyll via light absorption, it can react with oxygen to create reactive oxygen species, which the cell usually wants to avoid. So it instead controls it through three quenching mechanisms. That is, energy can be released as fluorescence, that molecule does itself, through photosynthesis, of course, which means that electrons are passed into the transport chain. And we also have heat dissipation, which can actively or passively engage, for example, in highlight adaption. And this fluorescence here, you can see, we can measure as this redshifted signal apart from the absorbers. And by measuring the amount of fluorescence and, for example, blocking the photosynthesis, we can estimate how these relative amounts of fluorescence, photosynthesis, and heat dissipation change, how these different quenching mechanisms engage or disengage. And how do we do it? Well, we use a light induction protocol. You can see here the fluorescence of the cell and that in different lights, first in dark, then in light again, and in dark. And overall, we measure at ground fluorescence and also we give strong light spikes, which tell us something about how strong the chlorophyll can even fluoresce. And what is important to us are these dynamics. These dynamics inform us about the photosynthetic state, about the steady state to synthesis usually, and how different adaption processes engage and relax again. Therefore, we selected this kind of measurement as good comparative data for a model. And here you can see such a comparison of experimental data in red and the simulation in black. And important is that these dynamics are captured. 
we simulated it first in dark and then in different light colors and even different light intensities. And all of that engages or disengages different light caption responses of the cell. And as I said, important to us are these dynamics that the ground fluorescence increases or decreases where the experimental data does it and also that the peak fluorescence does. These are the important things. And we know that this simulation is perfect. There are certain imperfections, especially underestimation of ground fluorescence in state two or an underestimation of the peak fluorescence during NPQ. But overall, what's important to us is that we captured the description of the photosynthetic processes and these adaption processes, and all of that can be traced to the fluorescence, which we estimate. So we think that the description can be, of course, improved, but it is quite good already. And since we model light absorption in a pigment-dependent manner, we can also simulate the behavior of differently adapted cells. Here you can see different simulations of cells which were grown at monochromatic light sources, which you see here at the top right. And the pigment content of these cells was measured, and then we simulated their reaction to always the same light protocol that you saw just now. You can see again that the fluorescence responses of these differ quite widely, not just in the height of the fluorescence response, but also how fast certain processes, for example, here engage or even don't engage. And these simulations illustrate how the light quality, quantity, and also the cellular absorption interplay, and how important it is to consider all of these factors when discussing photosynthesis. Next, we wanted to investigate aspects that could be useful for biotechnological application. And that is finding reactions, controlling the metabolic system, and also simulating target reaction. Here you can see what we're going to use next. We're going to simulate at monochromatic lights. So we overlaid here the absorption spectra of the most important photosynthetic pigments, for example, chlorophyll here in solid black, beta carotene, also picobillic proteins, and the colored spikes here mark monochromatic light sources that we simulate for the coming plots. In these four graphs that you see here, you can see the metabolic control that different pathways have on the steady state carbon fixation. That means we simulated the model under first different monochromatic light sources and also different intensities, and then slightly varied the flow through single reactions within the four pathways that you see, a light-driven electron flow, respiration, rubiscos, carbon fixation, and the terminal oxidase. And the stronger the color in each of these plots, the more effect these small perturbances had on the carbon fixation. And you can see, for example, that the light driven action flow from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1 had the heights control under the blue-violet and the far-red light colors. That means that uh, it is mostly then controlling when we're in the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. While Rubisco, on the other hand, the main carbon fixation enzyme, only gained control under higher light intensities. And not just that, but also wavelength specific. And we see that here in this orange red monochromatic light that the Rubisco gains control earliest. And if you look at the others, Rubisco and terminal oxidases, they had relatively little control throughout the whole process, but small patterns that we see also match, for example, between Rubisco and the terminal oxidases, meaning that the mechanisms behind all of that are still connected. All of these processes aren't just isolated. Overall, if you look at it, we see that the control shifts from the source reactions, so the photosystems, to the sink reactions, that is Rubisco, for increasing light. And often, it would be wise to target pathways with a high control for engineering. However, we see that the control is not always given. It shifts with both the intensity and also depends on the light color that we give the whole thing. And therefore, light is an important factor when we engineer new strains, and especially if you want to base that on models, because we have to keep that in mind, which of our pathways might actually be in control. In the next step, we also simulate other potential targets for bike production and how the light would affect those. So here we added to the model pseudoreactions that drain NADPH, ATP, and fix carbon in ratios that correspond to biotechnological target compounds. On the left, NADPH, and on the right, ATP, so purely. And then in the middle, we see isoprene and glycogen, whereby isoprene production consumes more NADPH and glycogen more ATP. And we see again that the light wavelength that we give the cells governs what the optimal light intensity for our production is, so where it is most yellow. And the production patterns that we see here, so the patterns where production is high, isoprene and glycogen, also seem like the mixture of an NADPH, ATP, and actually also a bit of the Rubisco control that we saw before. And that lets us think that the NADPH to ATP ratio that these compounds have actually governs the optimal light conditions in both light color and light intensity.
And if we just look at isoprene, we see that in general, the compound production was highest in the red orange light, lower in blue, and mostly absent in between. And a recent study found quite similar results. Here, an isoprene synthesizing silicon cystis strain had the highest growth rate and intermediate isoprene production in red light and the strong growth deficit in blue, so not a high yield phenotype. Interestingly though, these experiments also showed a high yield in green light and an even higher in violet, which even surpassed the production in red. We assume that since we didn't take into account pigment adaption in these analyses in the background, that these adaptions allowed the cells to surpass our predicted production rates, but that is also still under investigation. Now, leaving the biotechnological application, we also see potential in the model to investigate hypothetical mechanisms in the photosynthetic machinery. For well, that, as an example, we took the state transitions that I mentioned earlier. State transitions are an adaptive mechanism that is active under light spectra, which differentially excite our two photosystems two and one. And it is usually measured as a change in the photosystem fluorescence and especially in the ratio between the fluorescence of both of them. And it's usually regarded as a mechanism to balance the photosystem's excitation levels if one of them is more excited than the others. The problem is that the correct mechanism hasn't been yet found by consensus. And there are four main mechanisms proposed for this. The photosystem 2 quenching model. If photosystem 2 is overexcited, this overexcitation is dispelled as heat. The spillover model, where this overexcitation is drained to photosystem 1, so passed on. The phycobilism mobile model, where phycobilisms move between the two photosystems. And the PDS detachment model, where it detaches from the photosystems and interestingly, according to literature, they detach in the state where at least photos 2 receives less excitation. And to investigate these hypotheses, we implemented these four mechanisms in our model and used simple kinetic rate laws to describe them. But since we didn't know what the correct parameter values for this, we instead simulated 1,000 different models with a range of parameter values and then evaluated the distribution of simulation results. First, we tested if the mechanisms could provide a light adaptive effect. That means that it could alleviate the overreduction of the pastokinon pool when photosystem 2, so the entrance point, is overexcited. And in the plot, you can see our four different model hypotheses. And on the y axis, the PQ pool oxidation by activation of this mechanism. So that means the higher the value, the more stress relieves this mechanism gave the model. And you can see the distribution of our 1000 models here through the box plots and more in the relative terms of it through the violent plots. So where the violence are wider, there's more of our simulation results in that area. And you can see that the mechanisms that all of them, but the PBS detachment model were potentially advantageous to the cell. So they reduced the over reduction of the plastokinon pool. We furthermore tested if these models could replicate the shift in fluorescence, which I told you in the beginning, are typically associated with state transitions. Here, the spillover model showed a much lower response than expected, not as much fluorescence difference as we would see in usual experiments. And so assuming that true mechanisms behind state transitions would provide both a redox balancing effect and also the typical fluorescence pattern that we would find, we conclude that the photosystem 2 quenching model and the PBS mobile models are more likely to be the main mechanism that is present in cyanobacteria rather than the spillover model and the PBS attachment model. With this, I would already like to conclude and come to summary. I showed you a cytomaterial photosynthesis model, which we curated to represent the electron transport chain in detail. The reactions are characteristic ones that we find for cyanobacteria. And we included a high adaptability of both reactions to simulate mutants and also light handling to simulate different light conditions and also pigment conditions. We can simulate the photosynthetic electron fluxes and also cold amplitude modulation experiments, which are well captured in the model. And when we went more into the model, we also saw how the light spectrum governs where the control in our system lies, and especially between the source and the sink reactions. And for high technological target reactions, that these optimal light conditions can differ, which very likely is connected to the ATP to NH ratio. We also saw that we can test mechanistic hypothesis with the model by implementing the hypothesis first and then examining the simulations of them by which we could support two of our original four hypotheses for state transitions. And this model is already publicly available and submitted as a preprint. So if you were interested, you could test it out right now. 
Um, in the future, we'd also like to make this model even more attractive to use for research groups, especially in the biotechnological field. That means we want to simulate a broader range of biotechnological target reactions like hydrogen production or PHB or compound oxygenation in whole cell biocatalysis. We also want to investigate mechanisms and pathways that were right now in the current model version simplified or even not included, like the CO2 acquisition mechanisms and the effect that CO2 has on, for example, pH or the highlight damage reactions, the protomotive force, you name it. And we also think that with this model, we could simulate how a single cell could behave within a bioreactor where it travels through different layers of cells, which of course also shifts the light that the cell receives. Lastly, we're open for suggestions. If you have a particular process or data that you think would fit the scope of our model, then please talk to us and maybe we could find something to work together. I thank you all for your attention. I also want to thank my professor, Anna Matichinska, and especially from our group, Andreas Nakielski and Elena Kuhlmann, from Czechia, Dr. Tomasz Zavril and Jan Czaverni. From Düsseldorf, Dr. Oliver Ebenhöhl and Dr. Gabor Benat from Hungary, who all worked with us on making this preprint, on publishing it, who gave us the data. And of course, we are also heavily funded, especially by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft of the European Union and ministries in Czechia and Hungary. And now, if there's any questions, I will be very open for them. And thank you for your attention.